Thanks everybody for being on. We'll get started in about two minutes. Well, hello, everybody. It's Patrice Burgess and um, the chair of the group, and we are now at noon. So thanks, everybody, for joining and your participation both today and in prior meetings and, and in our email exchanges in between meetings. Uh, so really looking forward to today. Uh, things have been going fast and furious, as you guys all know, and this is going to be a great chance for us to kind of regroup and look at uh, what we've accomplished and what we've got set before us and learn a little bit uh, more about what's going on nationally and with other groups uh, that are working on this in the state. So just to kind of revisit our role, uh, we are really uh, advising the governor, as you all know, on prioritizing vaccines uh, when we have a limited supply and then also communication about the vaccine and the delivery of the vaccine, and then making sure that the access is equitable across the street, across the state, not the street. <laughs> so I'm gonna turn it over to Elke, who's gonna give a little bit more of an overview of uh, some of the other uh, groups that are working on this project as well. Great, thank you, Patrice. And if you could advance the slide, that would be great. So I'm gonna, again, uh, echo uh, Dr. Burgess's uh, welcome to everybody. Thank you all so much for being a part of our Coronavirus Advisory Committee. We really appreciate the time that you're taking to help us um, and to help advise the governor. Um, I wanted to give, we wanted to spend a little bit of time today in a couple of different locations, trying to do a little bit of grounding for folks so they can see the whole big picture of what's happening with the response. Um, and that's what I'll address right now a little bit. And then Sarah Leeds, when she gives her presentation, will give you um, kind of a broader picture of how we're actually addressing the whole issue of vaccines, not just the, the work that we're asking you all to do. I know there are some questions about that, and we wanna make sure that it's kind of clear where everything fits. Um, so uh, with this slide that you have here, um, it's not entirely, um, Clear, so I'm going to walk you through it when you just take a quick glance at it. Um, but there currently are three different uh, big advisory committees or working groups that are advising the governor on the response. So as you can see here, there's a governor's coronavirus financial advisory committee or CFAC. There's the governor's coronavirus working group that tackles a lot of these issues that, that um, uh, are related to vaccine and the, the things that you can see below that. And then there's also the Governor's Economic Rebound Advisory Committee. But underneath that, there's a lot of uh, layers of work that's going on. Um, a lot of that supported and, and kind of driven by the Department of Health and Welfare and the function that we serve in responding to the, um, to the pandemic. There are also a lot of other partners at play as well. We have the Idaho Office of Emergency Management, for example. But I wanted to focus more on that kind of the health aspects here, if you will. So we have work groups that have been established to address long-term care. We have a work group that's established to help support um, decision-making and advice around testing, the testing task force. Of course, we have the Idaho COVID-19 Vaccine Advisory Committee in addition to the program. 
And we also have a crisis standards of care group uh, that's been established to help um, help create a crisis standards of care document. And then um, kind of further on that, uh, uh, an activation committee that's being established. So the Department of Health and Welfare really supports those activities, helps um, um, uh, provide that administrative support, if you will, for those uh, work groups. Plus, of course, we have a lot of other things that are going on as well um, regarding hospital support, supporting schools, um, working with our local public health districts, kind of hand in glove through all of this, as well as that whole side related to epidemiology, contact tracing, case investigations, um, and, and all of the data that you see on our coronavirus.idaho.gov um, site. So there's, there's a lot to what's happening with the response, but um, really wanted to point out that this vaccine advisory committee is a, a hugely important piece of this whole movement going forward. And we'll certainly um, you know, have more time to talk about this as we have future meetings and can respond to any questions about that also in future meetings. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Patrice and talk a little bit more about you know, where we are and where we've been. Yeah, so uh, again, just kind of level set what we've already done and what we have yet to do, and then you'll learn more about, you know, some of the other activities that are going on. So um, again, decisions we've been made may need to be readdressed if something changes at the national level. But so far, the decisions that this group has made are that we would recommend accepting early distribution of vaccine at our existing ultra cold storage facilities. And then remember, we are rec making recommendations to the governor, but that's what we recommended. We also did our sub-prioritization of the phase 1A group to receive the vaccine. And um, we ranked uh, the essential worker group, the next group, which we'll be talking about a little bit later. One thing I do want to mention is we were using the same nomenclature, phase 1A, 1B, et cetera, as the CDC and the Advisory uh, Committee on Immunization Practices. But we're think we're just going to change to first group, second group, and and not get too hung up on one A, one B because there's a lot changing at the national level, and it's going to be complicated for us to keep changing our names if they keep changing their names. So basically, first group, second group, et cetera, is probably a, a better way to look at it, and you'll see more of that as we move along. So the items we still need to be that still need to be addressed are reviewing the updated uh, Advisory Committee on Immunization Practice Recommendations, which we're going to be talking about today, uh, where they uh, had some changes of, as far as 1A with long-term care residents and staff, so we'll talk about that. And then also when to activate the CDC Pharmacy Partnership for the long-term care facilities, and that will be a vote that we'll take later after we receive some information at this meeting. So um, with that, um, I think we'll go back to Elke again. Oh, one quick thing before uh, I turn it over to Elke. Uh, had a great suggestion last time about talking points, and so we'll be uh, working on those uh, for you all to have as well, and uh, some key messages that you can then take out to your constituent groups. All right, thanks, Patrice. Uh, as we state every meeting, we want to make sure that everyone is aware that we are taking public comment, and we want to make sure that um, people utilize our public comment email that we have available, which is uh, reading it out, COVID-19 the number 19, vaccine public comment at dhw.idaho.gov. Um, the public, like it says on the slide, that the, the meetings are open to the public in a listen-only mode. Public comments will be accepted in writing through that, that email box. Um, and I do want to uh, emphasize the fact that as these comments are coming in through this public um, email, we are sharing them with the, uh, the CVAC um, to make sure that you all have the latest conversations that are going on, the latest um, comments that are coming in. And so I just want to reassure the public who are listening in that we are uh, we are hearing what you're saying, and we are making sure that that information is relayed. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, everyone. Rather, welcome. We have a full agenda today. This is Monica Ravosi. I'm your facilitator. Um, and because we have such a full agenda, we're going to do what we did last time in terms of introductions. We're going to ask that you review the participant or the panelist list, rather, 
uh, where you will find our CVAC members, both voting and ex officio. And uh, you can also refer to the bios that are online um, on our website uh, if you'd like to get more information on any of our members. We also have a few designees today. Um, and if you haven't already let us know that you're a designee, if you could please do that in the chat, that would be great. Also wanted to let you know if you're not, if any of you are not receiving my emails, so CVAC members not receiving my emails, please let us know because I want to make sure that everyone's getting all the information in between meetings. With that, let's go ahead and turn to the agenda and take a look at what we're going to tackle today. First, we're going to hear from Sarah Leeds. She's going to give us an update on vaccine planning, including the pharmacy partnership. And then we'll hear from Dr. Burgess sharing the results of the CVAC voting member rankings on the subprioritization of our essential workers group. So now our group two, our second group. And after we hear about that, then we're going to turn to on the next slide. Uh, we're going to hear from Dr. Hahn, uh, our state epidemiologist, so that we get updated on recent ACIP deliberations and recommendations. A lot has happened since our last meeting. So we'll be getting up to date on that. And then Dr. Bridges will talk to us about uh, activating the CDC pharmacy long-term long care facility partnerships. And after we've uh, heard some good information from Dr. Bridges there, then Dr. Burgess uh, will lead us through a vote where voting members will weigh in on the approach. Finally, we'll hear from Dr. Bridges, an overview on the BioNTech, Pfizer, and Moderna vaccine studies so that you can hear the latest on what's going on there. And we'll wrap up and talk about next steps and next meetings. Uh, before I cover our functions, our orientation to our various remote participation functions, I just want to make sure that I draw your attention to the ground rules that are at the bottom of the agendas that were distributed to you in advance. Um, not to take extra time on that today, but just want to make sure you reference those. Um, they're important to keep in mind. So our housekeeping for today, our advisory committee participation functions. Uh, first of all, you are all familiar with muting meetings, uh, muting and unmuting. And if you can keep your video on for the majority of the meeting, that would be fantastic as we all get to know each other and see one another's faces. Uh, the hands up function, you're probably all uh, familiar with by now, but the way to activate that is to look at that participant list on the right side of my screen going down vertically and uh, press the hands up, um, or actually, sorry, underneath that list of names, there's a little hand, and that's where you would press the hands up so that we know that you'd like to share a comment verbally and live in the meeting. You can also use the chat function, and as before, we will have folks monitoring that chat and bringing questions forth um, at the appropriate discussion time. So please um, know that that is constantly being monitored and um, put your um, comments and questions in there as well. We have our quick feedback mechanism that we've used before, and as you can see here, it is actually next to the hands up button on your screen, but on the slide it shows you what it looks like. It's the little megaphone. We've used it before. We're going to use this when you get to weigh in, when our voting members will be weighing in today. It seems to be the quickest and easiest way of gathering your feedback. And I don't believe we're going to have any polling questions today, but if we ever did, they would pop up and we'd lead you through that as well. So I think that's our housekeeping for today. And with that, I think we are ready to uh, move into our first presentation. Sarah Leeds giving us an update on vaccine, vaccine planning. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for your attention. Um, I have, uh, next slide, please. I have a few topics that I'm going to talk to you about. I wanna just go over plan, a little bit of our plan roles and responsibilities and a few timelines that are uh, really kind of on the most urgent uh, calendar days for us. Uh, revisit our initial dose allocation and give you an update on that and then talk uh, very overarchingly about the Pharmacy Partnership for Long-Term Care program. And, um, and then there'll be more of that from uh, Dr. Bridges. So next slide, please. <clears throat> so just as a big picture, kind of where where all, all of our lanes are and, and, and our roles. Um, you all, as our COVID-19 Vaccine Advisory Committee, um, you advise the governor on and assist the state and local entities with sub-prioritization of vaccines when they're in limited supply um, based on the bigger 
groups that CDC's uh, Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices uh, identifies, <clears throat> uh, helping us with communication and messaging of vaccine, and <clears throat> also ensuring equitable access to COVID-19 vaccine across Idaho. And then at the state level, um, our role is uh, state, and there's of course a lot within all of these bullet points, but um, statewide logistics and planning, um, allocating, or once we get an allocation of a vaccine, uh, we work with our enrolled providers to figure out how to distribute that to providers throughout the state. <clears throat> we provide training to our vaccinators and reporting to the CDC and Operation Warp Speed and others uh, in, the, in the public and media and our leadership, of course, and the governor, and also helping with communications. And then at the local public health district and enrolled providers, um, they, they, they do vaccine administration. Um, at the local public health level, they are helping us with regional logistics and planning. And at the enrolled provider level, they work on organizational logistics and planning. And also everyone there is responsible for vaccine storage and handling if they are administered if they're an enrolled provider and administering vaccine and also reporting. And those are just uh, kind of big picture uh, roles for all of us. Um, of course, there's a lot of minutia in there. Next slide, please. So some of our big dates, um, today is one of them. As you remember, you voted a few meetings ago about to have Idaho accept early distribution uh, from CDC for this Pfizer dose, and that today was the is the final day that we had to confirm the sites for early distribution. And just as a reminder, what early distribution means is when the FDA says yes, the Pfizer vaccine can have an emergency use authorization. Pfizer will ship however many trays uh, the, so that we ordered for our, for our early distribution sites, they will ship those. They are not allowed to be administered until the ACIP has those, or makes the recommendation to administer vaccine. So then again, once the ACIP makes the recommendation for the vaccine, all the other enrolled providers that we have identified for our dose, those first allocation of doses, those, those shipments will go out from Pfizer. And so uh, as a reminder, the lead time between early distribution sites administering vaccine and when all the other sites can administer vaccine is 24 hours uh, at most 48 hours. So in December 10th, the FDA's committee that is the, called the Vaccines and Related Biological Products Committee, uh, they will they are scheduled to review the Pfizer safety and vaccine safety and efficacy data uh, for their vaccine. Um, once that happens, uh, so I have we 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 don't. There's a window from after that meeting, December 11th and beyond, is the window of time uh, that Pfizer. Um, the e, FDA would make an issue, would issue an FDA, sorry, FDA would issue an EUA and the advisory committee on immunization practices has a meeting and makes a recommendation for the vaccine. Once ACIP makes that recommendation, shipments can happen to all the en enrolled providers. So um, I have another slide that shows you the number of doses um, trays that we have in our allocation. Um, also, another important date is um, December 17th, as you are all probably aware, um, Moderna put in their application for an EUA for their vaccine as well. And so December 17th is the day that that Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee needs to review the safety and efficacy data of the Moderna vaccine. And then Again, there's that December 18th and beyond, there's a window of time that the FDA will look and at the data 
and issue an EUA for the Moderna vaccine, and then ACIP again meets to review the data to make a recommendation to actually administer the vaccine. And then so after, whenever that happens, uh, that ACIP recommendation, the Moderna vaccine shipments will happen. Next slide, please. So what is our allocation formula? So currently what CDC is telling us whenever we have, we're anticipating shipments of doses for either Moderna or Pfizer, they, they, they put out a number, they, they hold 10% back for an emergency reserve, and then the remaining 90% is split between dose one and dose two because they wanna make sure that if there's 13,000 doses of, for dose one, that there's an additional 13,000 for that dose two for every jurisdiction. Um, and then it's distributed to states and territories on a population pro rata basis. And so the first allocation that we are planning on, uh, CDC has told us is 6.4 million. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So the current allocation numbers for Idaho um, are 13,650 doses. And that's about 14 trays. So if you remember from last meeting, you, we had a similar table up on our slide and there was a significantly higher number. It was about 15, 53,000 and some other additional doses, but it was 53 trays of vaccine. And so, you know, what happened between our last CVAC meeting and when the anticipated, the anticipated doses were much higher? And well, it was that national allocation number for the first distribu distribution changed. Um, so, and that they clarified the formula for distribution. Um, so that's how we have 13,650, which um, makes it makes, makes the choice uh, for those first groups of people very difficult. Um, we have way more healthcare providers um, in that group than than 13,650. But the good news is that we anticipate the, a, a pretty significant ramping up of doses by the end of the year and in the beginning of Jan, uh, 2021. Next slide, please. So um, you're gonna see how this pharmacy partnership is tied into these allocations in uh, Dr. Bridges' presentation um, and also with Dr. Hahn as well. but. Um, the FED, there's a federal program that is called the Pharmacy Partnership for Long-Term Care Program. And it's a federal program that provides end-to-end -end management of COVID-19 vaccination at long-term care facilities. And they are using that, that term very broadly to include skilled nursing facilities, resident-assisted living facilities, <clears throat> and... Um, yeah, so um, then there's a contractual agreement between CDC with Walgreens and CVS for this first phase of distribution. Um, in coming meetings, we'll talk more about that because the, the large chain pharmacies expand later. But right now, you know, all of our focus is on this phase one, this first group of, of both vaccinators in this partnership program and also who will be vaccinated. Um, so what this contractual agreement, the goal of it is that um, the man, it reduces the burden on long-term care facilities to coordinate uh, to get their, their residents and staff vaccinated. And it also reduces the burden on state and local public health jurisdictions for the vaccination of the residents in those facilities. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So the pharmacy partner program has some rules and uh, guidelines for activation. And so the state, every state has the authority to activate the program. Um, and ultimately that lies with our governor. Um, we expect uh, you all, and we're hoping that you all uh, will recommend uh, to us what week Idaho activates that program and uh, Governor Little makes the final decision. And there are, CDC has some requirements for how 
how we get to choose um, allocation to that program. And Dr. Bridges will talk the details more about that in her presentation. Next slide, please. I'm ready for questions. Looks like we have a hands up uh, from Rob Geddes. Great, thank you, Sarah. I appreciate the, the good overview and concise uh, presentation on where we're at today. Um, just this may be jumping the gun, but just wanted to put this out there for consideration. Do we do we know how um, as a state we're going to be communicating to the general public um, who's eligible for the vaccine at what time? That it is a great question, and we are working those details out. We have a communications team. We have a staff member within the immunization program, um, and then we have yeah. others you know, at, within the department and our and our division of public health who are all working on that. Okay, thank you. I'm just kind of envisioning that maybe it'll be somewhat web-based where people can go to a website and see if they fit the criteria. Is that in line with what's, what's possibly being worked on? You know, I, I would have to get back to you on that. I, I apologize, I don't know the answer. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We have some questions in the chat if there are no other raised hands. Let's go ahead with the chat. Okay, um, Sarah, can you briefly describe how allocation is determined um, what, based on population? Yeah, great. So this first dose, this first allocation, um, we at the program level are using the percentages that you voted on last last meeting, I was gonna say last week, uh, two weeks ago, um, which I think if we went back to that table, it was slide six. Um, so how we distribute um, our doses, and yeah, thanks for asking that question because I really did not spend too much time on that. So. Based on how, knowing that we have 13,650 doses shipping to Idaho once um, once ACIP makes their recommendation and also know that three of those trays, of those 14 trays, will be in Idaho for early distribution. Um, and but, but we use the percentages in that second column, the percentage of, of inpatient healthcare workers and long-term care staff. And, and because there was so little, the, the, there's such a little amount of doses, um, we, we kept with this percentage. And um, you'll hear phase 1A has expanded quite a bit and you'll hear more from that, more about that from Dr. Hahn and her presentation. Um, phase 1A is much larger now, and um, but but because the doses are so limited, we felt like we could stick with this percentage because there's so few doses. Thanks, Sarah. And, and the allocation to Idaho is based on our uh, the proportion of Idaho's population relative to the nation. Correct. Okay. Um, Absolutely. And then can you also clarify on the first 13,650 doses. Um, the question is, does this mean only 6,825 people will be vaccinated in the first group or will it be 13,650? It will be 13,650. So, so we're, you know, and we're anticipating that in a couple weeks, ACIP and e, the EUA will be issued and ACIP will have, will make their recommendation for Pfizer vaccine and the doses will immediately be shipped and arrive in Idaho, we'll begin administering. We know that three weeks later, another 13,650 dose, dose two will arrive. And we have the systems in place that um, those folks will get a reminder, rec a recall, uh, either a text message <clears throat> or an email. They're getting, there's, there's a number of redundant systems in place that help remind that individual that they need to come back for dose two. 
but but that is 13,650 individuals with this allocate with this shipment of dosing. Great. Thanks, Sarah. There's a couple more questions in the chat, but they will be answered um, as we move through our presentations. So um, I'm going to turn it back over to you for raised hands. We had a raised hand from Christine Newhoff. Yeah, it's uh thank you. I, I do have a question about this. So and I, I know this is for the, the first distribution to us. And um, I'm not sure if we have a sense of how many doses will be in the you know, future distributions, but, um, but looking at this number, uh, it um, certainly isn't going to cover all of what we've been calling 1A, and it likely doesn't even cover the first, uh, first, priori first sub-prioritized group. So uh, I'm interested in knowing if the, if the expectation is that only people in that first sub prioritized group will be getting vaccine from this initial distribution or to what extent there's uh, um, some fluidity among those sub prioritized groups with respect to the vaccine that's initially distributed. I just want to clarify. I heard you right. Did you say about fluidity? Is that the word I heard? In terms of the uh, how how strictly are those sub prioritized groups expected to be adhered to as vaccine becomes available yeah well we we, we do want to adhere to them but we also know um we aren't what we don't we don't have a really solid sense of vaccine uptake which is um as you may know how many who how many people or what percentage of our of our population will actually accept the vaccine and want to get it and so there's Got, there, it, there will be some flexibility at the local level to, um, I mean, the thing we do not want to have is wasted vaccine. So we don't want providers sitting on that vaccine, like, okay, well, I've got all my healthcare providers in my facility vaccinated, so I'm just going to hold the next however many doses we have. We don't want that. And so we're working with providers um, as we've started provider education um, and and there's and and also working with our local public health districts to understand the, that there's we we want them to stick with the tiers of and the sub, the prioritized subgroups but there's also a balance of if you if you don't have folks clamoring to get those slots and those vaccines that we want you to identify the next group so um so it, so it's it's there is fluidity, there's flexibility, and we're working with providers as we train them on that. We do have some time for more questions, if we have any that will not be answered later in the meeting. Thank you, Kathy, for helping uh, manage that. Any other questions in the chat for right now? Um, I was looking through it. No, I think I think we'll wait until a few more presentations. Okay, excellent. And I don't see any other hands up at the moment. So with that, I think we are ready to turn to our next item on the agenda, which is uh, Dr. Burgess sharing with us the CVAC voting member rankings of subprioritization of essential workers group. Dr. Burgess. Yeah. Thank you so much. So um, remember our process, we uh, decided um, is we would do our vote by email between meetings. Once you guys have all the information that you need, are able to review all the comments, both in chat and public comments that were all reviewed between the meeting and you did the vote and then we're presenting you this vote as final. Again, unless we have some compelling issue nationally or otherwise that makes us revisit it. But this is to show you the results and not to really discuss, but just show you how they uh, worked out. And this is really our second group after the first group that we already did. So as you can see here, the vote turned out uh, with first responders. Um, except those that are already included in the first group that we did um, would be so fire, police, uh, those types of folks. Then the next group would be the pre-K through 12 school staff and teachers as well as daycare workers. 
Then the next group, correctional detention facility staff, except the ones that are already covered in the first group that we talked about, which would be the, the medical staff. Uh, food processing workers were next, followed by grocery and convenience store workers, followed by the Idaho National Guard, and then lastly, other essential workers that are not, not already included and that cannot telework or social distance uh, when they're at work. So that's the, the, the sequence that we came up with uh, with our vote. And again, we'll readdress if we need to, if there's some compelling uh, change in the national landscape or something else that comes along. So I think uh, next we're going to hear from Dr. Hahn about the recent uh, ASIP meeting and new developments. Thank you, Patrice. Can uh, you all hear me okay? Great. Yes. Great. Thank you. Yeah, so I wanted to make sure, I know some of this has been in the news, but just um, some of us are very familiar with the Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices, and uh, some folks on this call are probably not as familiar. So I want to do a few slides catching up, make sure you understand what the committee is and what they do, and uh, then talk about their recent uh, recommendations that were just made um, earlier this week on Tuesday. So uh, lots happening. Um, next slide, please. So this is a, just a, a overview for you all. The Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices is a federal advisory committee that makes recommendations to CDC uh, for their considerations. Uh, their objectives are listed. I won't read them out, uh, but you can see there that they are there to uh, give advice uh, and guidance, and particularly that last bullet I want to draw to your attention about use of vaccines and related agents. Uh, for effective control of vaccine preventable diseases in the civilian population. So just so you're aware, the, fed, the, the military has their own process. Um, recommendations are reviewed by the CDC director, and if the uh, CDC director uh, agrees, they are published in the MMWR, the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report from CDC. Uh, usually that process takes a couple of weeks, but we already had a, a for this particular recommendation, I'll show you, uh, they did uh, publish it actually the following day um, in, in order to expedite things. So um, usually this is a deliberate process. Um, you can see there a, a vaccine might get licensed, let's say in December. In that case, um, the usual meeting for the schedule for ASIP would be to meet in February. They usually meet February, June, and October, three times a year, like clockwork. And usually that would take several months maybe before ASIP even meets to formally uh, make recommendations. But this is so this is incredibly, um, you know, out of their norm to have uh, come up with these uh, and publish these uh, recommendations so quickly. Next slide. So I already mentioned the uh, three times per year. Usually it's in person at CDC. Um, and of course, uh, since COVID actually, these meetings have been held um, completely virtually. And um, there's always been an option for public to listen in, uh, but and, and also there's public comment periods and so forth, but now that has all been done virtually. Um, there are work groups focused on specific vaccines and topics such as Ebola, influenza, um, work groups that just work on general best practices, such as choice of needles, um, education that should be provided, et cetera. And these groups are really critical. They're the backbone of that committee and they get together, review the science, discuss evidence and develop the recommendations presented to ASIP, which then ASIP has got a lot of, a, a lot of work and thought has already gone into it before they do their um, triannual meeting. Um, and there is a COVID-19 work group that was formed in April. It is currently meeting weekly to discuss um, uh, recommendations to be brought up to the full ASIP committee. Next slide. So here is the recent deliberations of the Advisory Committee for Immunization on Immunization Practices. And you can see here the June was actually sort of their normally scheduled meeting. Uh, they got an update basically on the disease, immunology, epi, vaccines, et cetera. Um, they had an update, a special meeting in July to talk more about some of the ongoing trials, safety considerations, et cetera. Uh, another meeting in August and another meeting in September. Um, and then most recently, um, and what I want to highlight in the next few slides is in November 23rd, they met um, and they 
reviewed um, what they call the evidence to recommendations framework and they also published um, their ethical principles for allocating initial supplies of COVID vaccine in the MMWR on that same day. Since then they met um, Tuesday uh, and they actually had a vote on what they're calling phase 1A uh, for who should receive that vaccine. Next slide. So this is just uh, the, a table, an essential table I want to draw your attention to. I urge you to, um, in fact, if somebody can drop it in the chat, a link to that. Um, otherwise, I can do it when I'm done speaking. But um, this is the publication that they published in, in November 23rd, outlining their ethical principles. And you can see on the left the main um, principles there. Uh, very similar to, I think, our principles. But I just want to make sure you're aware of what, what ASIP is using as their guiding uh, principles. Uh, next slide. At the end of the November 23rd meeting, though, I think uh, with a bit of a uh, change for, from what had been initially, and I'm sorry, somebody just went off mute and I'm hearing a lot of background noise. So if somebody wouldn't mind re-muting themselves. Thank you. If, um, so at any rate, so phase 1A um, at the end of the meeting, of the November meeting, it was proposed to add long-term care facility residents to what had previously been um, discussed that it would mostly, probably likely uh, be healthcare providers. Um, so this was proposed in the November meeting and also that phase 1B would be essential workers and that phase 1C would be the other group um, talked about uh, as critical group to vaccinate during phase one, which is adults with high risk medical conditions and all adults over 65 and older, whether or not they were the resident of a long-term care facility. So this is what was proposed and discussed in November. Um, next slide. So the December meeting that just happened on Tuesday, this is uh, the vote that was taken, the interim recommendation um, and You'll notice that they are numbered one healthcare personnel and two residents of long term care facilities, but they made it very clear verbally and the uh, MMWR also um, made it clear these are not priority prioritized that is healthcare personnel are not prioritized over residents of long term care facilities, they are to be considered they're being recommended equally to be vaccinated as phase 1A and you can see the definitions um, there that ASIP used as they did their vote. Next slide. So this is the MMWR that uh, just was released. Um, thank you, Angela, for posting the, the other MMWR. And um, if you wouldn't mind uh, posting this December one as I, I December third uh, MMWR as well. I think many of you have seen this, but just so you have that in hand. Next slide. I will now go through the main points from this publication. So healthcare providers um, are defined, again, I think this is important to note, unpaid persons are included serving in healthcare settings uh, who have the potential for exposure to patients or infectious materials. Um, it includes folks um, that, that does include people who aren't direct patient care, such as food environmental administrative. However, uh, the publication makes a note that jurisdictions might consider first offering vaccine to healthcare providers whose duties require proximity within six feet to other persons. And um, they also added that public health authorities and healthcare systems should work together to ensure COVID-19 vaccine access to healthcare providers who are not affiliated with hospitals. And I wanna emphasize this point, there have been a lot of questions about um, you know, whether uh, whether this should just be uh, focused for hospitals initially. And I want to remind everyone that the vote that CVAC took included clinic workers, and uh, we should not view this as uh, for hospitals only. Um, they're certainly very, very important. But um, as I think San uh, Sarah said earlier, uh, we don't want anybody sitting on vaccine. Um, we want to make sure that um, all healthcare providers who uh, met our first tier in CVAC are considered as we have our initial uh, doses of vaccine. Uh, next slide. Uh, the MMWR publication uh, from this week went on to say that the definition of long-term care facility residents um, and uh, 
uh, that are defined as persons who reside in facility facilities provide, sorry, I'm like, Sarah, I'm starting to stumble over my words, provide a range of services, including medical personal care to persons who are unable to live independently, um, and that uh, jurisdictions might consider first offering vaccination to residents and healthcare personnel in skilled nursing facilities. So they consider prioritizing skilled nursing facilities because of high medical acuity and the high mortality rates in those settings. Um, now, uh, and ASIP members also during the meeting did call for additional safety monitoring. There was concern brought up that in skilled nursing facilities in particular, people may not be able to be um, as, uh, first of all, that the, the medical the acuity of care is not as high as, let's say, in a hospital setting, and there may not be the um, as good systems in place to look for adverse events, and we needed to make sure that those were uh, top of mind as we started to vaccinate in long-term care facilities. I did see a question in the chat earlier about whether intermediate care facilities were still included, and yes, they are. Um, uh, skilled nursing, um, assisted living, and intermediate care facilities are all considered long-term care facilities for this program. Um, next slide. Uh, lastly, uh, the last points made in the publication were that um, these vaccines, and we know the Pfizer vaccine that will be first, um, does require cold and ultra cold storage, specialized handling, and large minimum order requirements. We saw the, the 975 doses. Um, they are most feasibly maintained in centralized vaccination clinics, such as acute healthcare settings, or through the federal partnership. So the idea being that it would be challenging to try to get these potentially to small rural or isolated clinics right away. Um, that said, and again, please wait for Dr. Bridges' presentation as we talk about what our, what our plans are as we, as we move forward. Um, and then also ASIP will consider vaccine specific recommendations in additional populations uh, beyond phase A phase 1A, uh, once a vaccine is available. As Sarah said, and we are just learning this this week, um, if the FDA meeting, which is uh, scheduled to be next Thursday, if they're able to issue a decision by the end of that day, um, such as an EUA, an emergency use authorization, CDC is going to try to meet as quickly as possible and possibly even as soon as the following day, uh, the 11th, to try to create specific recommendations for this Pfizer vaccine rather than the general recommendations that you've seen so far. So that is possibly going to happen as quickly as the following day. Next slide. Um, so also CDC has a website uh, which has information on um, interim, interim considerations for vaccination and um, Angela, you're going to kill me, but could you <laughs> could you put this link in the chat as well? I should have let you warned you ahead of time. I'd be asking you to do this, um, but I think it'd be handy for people to have that and review it. I just pulled out an excerpt um, for you to note, and because I think this is super important, that there is a recommendation in here to consider staggering delivery of vaccine to healthcare provider in any facility. Uh, and the reason for this is if, let's say, a facility vaccinated, let's say, all their nurses on a single day, which might be how we would do um, other vaccine programs, or that would be our goal. Um, in this case, you may have some um, healthcare providers that end up with a mild febrile reaction or muscle aches or some types of symptoms that might require them to be excluded from work, not because of the severity of the symptoms, but because of the possibility that it could be COVID. Um, just because there's high community rates of COVID in, in many communities, especially in Idaho, of course, and in other states with high rates of disease. So that is a consideration that is somewhat unique to this situation and important to, for us to keep in mind. Um, that uh, health uh, hospitals, for example, large clinics will not be able to sweep through and, um, or at least the recommendation is that they not sweep through and vaccinate all their staff in a single uh, day. Uh, next slide. So I think this is my final slide. I just want to wrap up by remind you all that you're being asked to help make recommendations to the department and the governor on implementation in Idaho, um, considering those ASIP recommendations we've seen, remembering our, our goals and principles that CVAC has um, approved and, and formed. And then lastly, practical considerations to inform the implementation of this program 
um, that maximizes the opportunities to get vaccinated, to get folks vaccinated. So I'll leave it at that. Um, I think there's one more slide maybe for questions. Yeah. Any questions about, uh, and of course I'll be on the rest of the call. After doc, you may have more after Dr. Bridges. Dr. Burgess, do you have a question? It's actually more of a comment. I just wanted to, to dovetail on to what Dr. Hahn said about uh, side effects of healthcare worker or side effects. Uh, our healthcare facilities, especially the, the larger ones, have a screening process, so they would actually fail the screening and not be able to get in the building if they had those kinds of symptoms. So it would be not so much that they're not capable of working, but they wouldn't pass the screening at the door. Yes, thank you, Patrice. That's exactly what we are um, concerned about, that uh, folks would just not be able to work, even if they say, I feel okay, I, I can work, but boy, I, you know, I've got a little bit of a fever. That just won't uh, be possible. Other questions, either in the chat or um, live, hands up. Um, they, there are some questions in the in the chat. Um, the, fir the first one is, would it be possible to email the links to the members of the task force? I think that is yes. After the meeting, we will um, follow up with links to all of the um, publications that were referenced. Um, and then there is a question about um, um, the specifics of the long-term care facility, um, the makeup of the that group. And I think we'll wait until after um, Dr. Bridges' presentation, it might be answered there. Excellent. Well, I'll make one more call for any other questions before we move to our next presentation. Excellent. All right. Well, let's go ahead and move on. Thank you, Dr. Hahn. Uh, let's uh, move on then to our discussion. We are at our 110 agenda item, by the way. We're a little bit ahead of schedule. Uh, discussion of when to activate the CDC Pharmacy Long-Term Care Facility Partnership with Dr. Bridges. Hey, this is Carolyn Bridges. Um, can you hear me, Monica? Yes. Okay, great. Next slide, please. So as um, Chris and Sarah both mentioned, ACFP is now recommending that long-term care facility residents are included in that phase 1A along with healthcare personnel. Um, so uh, that includes, just to reiterate, skilled nursing, assisted living, and intermediate care facilities. Um, states are responsible for making the decisions. Uh, it was, uh, it's clear to CDC and others that there's not enough vaccine with that first shipment um, to cover everyone. Uh, and um, just to uh, reiterate, we have these two first vaccines that we think that we will uh, receive uh, first, uh, perhaps around December 15th for Pfizer being the first one. It does have significant um, cold chain uh, challenges and Moderna vaccine is likely to follow soon after. The CDC Pharmacy Partnership for Long-Term Care Facilities can provide end-to-end -end vaccination for long-term care facility residents. That was the group that it was uh, designed for initially, uh, but they are also able to vaccinate now unvaccinated staff. And about 90% of Idaho's long-term care facilities have opted to participate. Next slide. So some of the rationale, of course, for um, including long-term care facility residents in this group 1A, is that they make up a high proportion of COVID-related deaths. In Idaho, over a third of our COVID-19 related deaths have been among long-term care facility residents and nationwide, that's about 40%. The pharmacy partnership is poised to vaccinate a large percentage um, of these residents, uh, but um, the system when turned on requires about a two weeks notice to get started Part of that is because these uh, contract pharmacies will be uh, needing to contact each individual facility um, that has opted in to participate to help arrange times to come and do the vaccinating um, and allow time for family members uh, or guardians 
uh, and of course the residents themselves to consent to vaccination so that they can know how many doses they need to uh, bring to that particular site for vaccination. So about a two week lead time is needed. The program requires that 50% uh, of the doses needed um, are available to start that program. So Idaho would need to have essentially 50% of the needed doses in our vaccine bank. So those are uh, vaccine doses allocated to the state within a week of activating that system. So uh, CDC estimates um, that there are about 14,910 long-term care facility staff uh, and residents um, each. So what they assumed was uh, they looked at um, essentially bed capacity and then they assumed that there was approximately one staff person per resident. So these are slightly different from the numbers that Idaho has, but they are um, in the ballpark. And so this is what we're using for this particular uh, planning purpose that CDC is asking us to use um, their number. The next slide. So this just uh, reiterates where we were with our estimates. Um, Idaho is estimated anywhere from 12,000 to 17,000 residents uh, in these different types of facilities. Uh, and so that 14,900 is, is definitely within the ballpark there. Next slide. And um, this is the subprioritization for healthcare personnel that the committee um, voted on. Um, I want to just uh, uh, let you uh, be aware of an update to this particular table. Um, uh, at the first um, versions of this table, um, uh, we had just uh, in the cumulative persons column, that column to the right, that just included all hospital staff. It's taken some time and a lot of effort on uh, Chris Carter's part and, and others to try and help estimate how many people uh, would fit into the other part of that um, first row. So hospital uh, staff and then to add clinic staff. So this may be an overestimation, but um, our current estimate that we're working with in that cumulative numbers of persons for that first row of hospital and clinic staff essential for the care of COVID-19 patients and maintaining hospital capacity. That's an estimate of about 44,000 people. So next slide. So as uh, Sarah has noted, um, Idaho's first uh, vaccine allocations are small but we uh, know that um, there is a uh, promise to make enough vaccine for everybody who wants it uh, eventually. And so those um, allocations will continue over time uh, as vaccine production ramps up. As those allocations of vaccine uh, increase, uh, a vaccine that's allotted or allocated to Idaho will be um, put in our queue to be able to um, use uh, and so once we have enough vaccine quote, in the bank, um, then um, that can cover half of that uh, uh, number needed for long-term care fa uh, facility residents and staff, then we could uh, turn on this uh, CDC pharmacy long-term care facility partnership. So I'm going to show you some tables to help illustrate how this allotment um, might work. And so um, these are estimates, as, as Sarah has said over and over, we don't always know exactly how many we're going to get until we actually get them, but this is what our current estimates are, is that, and, and again, we have to wait for the Food and Drug Administration to make their decision. So a lot of caveats here, uh, but for illustration purposes, if we expect in week one uh, that we'll get approximately 13,650 doses it will be Pfizer vaccine. Um, Moderna vaccine will not be uh, available, we're assuming, in week one. So our total number of doses available is 13,650. So that number is less than half of that that would be needed for the long-term care facility partnership. Uh, and that number needed is that 14,900. 
that there is not enough vaccine allocated to Idaho in week one for that long-term care facility partnership to be turned on. In week two, uh, uh, the estimate is that we will get an additional 15,600 doses of Pfizer vaccine and 28,000 doses of the Moderna vaccine. So that will be a total for week two of 43,600 um, doses. So at that point, the um, pharmacy partnership could be turned on for long-term care because we would have enough doses allocated to us um, to start the process of uh, vaccination. So then that vaccine allocated to Idaho, that would, uh, for that long-term care facility partnership, would essentially be moved over to the pharmacies that are doing that vaccinating. Um, in week three, then, for example, we have um, an estimated 19,000 Pfizer doses and an estimated 12,000 um, Darren doses for a total of 13,900 uh, doses in week three. Uh, some of those would go uh, to continuing with long-term care facility partnership vaccination and the rest again for our other phase 1A healthcare personnel. I hope that was clear, it's complicated. Um, next slide, we'll try one more slide see if this uh, uh, is also helpful. So just to reiterate, the CDC uh, uh, population estimates for long-term care facility staff and residents is around 29, almost 30,000 uh, individuals. Uh, in order to turn on that partnership, uh, we will need to have kind of in the vaccine bank almost 15,000 doses. We will not have 15,000 doses in the bank um, until week two. And in that week two, um, if that partnership is turned on, then uh, 14,910 doses would go to the long-term care facility partnership for vaccination of staff and residents and the remainder of those doses um, in that week's allotment would go for phase 1A. So next slide. Some additional considerations is that um, Idaho, if every state who opts into this program, Idaho included, will need to designate a one particular vaccine for the program. At this point, either Moderna or Pfizer vaccine. Again, the first uh, vaccine anticipated is the Pfizer, which has a number of challenges in uh, terms of maintaining the ultra cold, um, cold chain uh, and may best be used in more high throughput settings with access to ultra cold storage. States that turn on the program also um, agree to let pharmacy partners optimize use of remaining vaccine to align with ACIP and jurisdiction guidance and allow for pharmacy partner staff who are providing vaccinations to be vaccinated. And as I, uh, we've mentioned, uh, most long-term care facilities are participating, but not all. So those remaining long-term care facilities will need to work with their public health districts and other partners to ensure that um, those uh, residents and staff have access to COVID-19 vaccines. Next slide. So given these considerations and considering that the committee has previously voted to prioritize first, hospital and clinic staff essential for care of COVID-19 patients, maintaining hospital capacity, the question is, does the CVAC recommend the Idaho vaccinate uh, or activate, excuse me, the CDC pharmacy partnership for long-term care facilities program? A uh, yes vote by the CVAC supports a plan to provide COVID-19 vaccine allocations to the CDC Pharmacy Partnership Program for long-term care facility residents and unvaccinated staff, starting when there are enough doses available to vaccinate 50% of residents and staff. I believe that's my last slide, and I will turn it over uh, to Patrice Anelke.
Thanks, Ms. Patrice. Um, before we do this vote, um, I would see if there are any questions in the chat or hands raised. We have a hand raised, um, Randall Hudspeth. Hi, thank you. I, I just want to clarify before we do the vote. Now, would the implementation long-term care be del at what point would that be because I'm thinking we have uh, a limited number of vaccines and it seems to me that uh, although this is an important group but those people working in hospitals where we're already running short of beds should be a priority in my mind over long-term care now is that is that what this yet a yes vote to support this would mean or does this mean that at the get-go a percentage of available vaccines will be delegated to long-term care wanted to check if everyone was able to hear that comment the audio was going in and out just a little bit so i wanted to I, know I, I think i got it um got it? okay I think he's he's asking, asking. He's <laughs> thank you yeah, he's asking okay. if a yes vote would mean um, would the, would healthcare workers still get that initial limited vaccine, um, or would it go to the long-term care facility residents? And um, I'm I'm going to take a stab at it, but Carolyn or or Chris or anybody, please correct me if I'm wrong. When we looked at those those charts and numbers, we need to get 50 percent of supply first before we could activate the long-term care facility. So that would look like uh, week two, if everything is according to what we think, before we would have that 50%, so exactly on this slide. So week one, that initial allotment would go to the healthcare workers, and then uh, our vote would be to activate the program when we have 50% uh, at least, which would, if everything goes according to plan, would be week two. And we're wording it the way we are because we we don't know if these numbers are going to stick. So we rewarded it when we actually have the 50%. Um, so I'm going to stop there and make sure I'm correct. Yeah, Patrice, this is Chris Hahn, and, and certainly Sarah Leeds and others can that are on the call can jump in if, if I'm not clear enough. But I agree. That is my understanding is week one, regardless, will go for healthcare providers. Week two, if we activate the partnership, and that's shown, I think, on the next slide, yes, some would be designated now. You see in the far right column, 14,900 doses would be going to long-term care to start that program, but there would be a, still a big bump in the number of vaccines going to continue to implement vaccination for healthcare providers because the if, if Moderna uh, gets approved, we will be expecting to receive 43,000, over 43,000 doses that next week. And honestly, I think just, you know, we will probably be looking at a situation where we are moving vaccine as quickly as possible, but it's going to be a, a very quick ramp up. So I actually think we'll do better the more we spread this vaccine out in the beginning. The other thing is we have that two week ramp up. So um, activating the program gives gives that two week uh, ramp up to get started, correct? Yes, yep. Any other comments? Go ahead. Yeah. I don't know if there's anyone um, on the phone um, on the long-term care facility side, but um, cer certainly there are issues uh, where if you're not able to move patients out of a hospital to long-term care facilities and and vice versa, um, it causes a lot of problems. So um, I think these uh, vaccinating these uh, two groups um, actually really helps out the healthcare system as well. And I leave that to others to, to discuss as well. Any other comments on that or anything else related to the original question? Monica, there are some questions in the chat if we wanna to move to the chat. Perfect timing, yes, please. Great, great, okay. So um, 
So there, these are a couple of questions, um, not necessarily, well, might be related to the vote. So the first one is, will the COVID vaccine be recommended for symptomatic healthcare workers following vaccination if they develop fever prior to returning to work? Not, not the vaccine, but will COVID testing be recommended? Testing. Is the question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Burgess. So I, I, I'm going to I'm going to say what I think, um, but Dr. Honor Bridges, I would I think the the symptoms that we hear about are 20 about 24 hours um, after the vaccine. So it would seem to me if if somebody's symptoms came and went in 24 hours, COVID testing them wouldn't make sense to me. But um, I'm going to see if everybody else agrees. Other comments? Yeah. yeah. I agree. Within about 48 hours, it looks like within the first two days after vaccination, symptoms resolve pretty quickly. Okay, and there was a question earlier on, and it was basically what percentage of our our population in phase, what is now phase 1A, will um, that first allocation of 13,650 cover? And it's only yeah. about... 30% if we do the math. Um, but um, I, think, I think what is important for everyone to understand is that we will have enough allocation in the first three weeks of allocation to cover the long-term care facilities and healthcare personnel that, that are in the, in the table that was displayed earlier. Um, so I just wanna make sure that question got answered. There's another question um, regarding if we have to designate a single vaccine for the farm, the pharmacy partnership program, um, the, the comment is, would it make sense to declare Moderna and, and then when there's adequate vaccine, then we can activate. And so, um, we might have to go over what that activation process entails. Because it is kind of confusing. Maybe we can walk through it one more time. All right. Who would be best to do that? So, um, so this is Carolyn. I guess I'll start. In terms of the Moderna versus the Pfizer vaccine, that is something that the um, state would need to uh, designate which vaccine. Um, and as, as we have said multiple times, these uh, dose estimates and um, estimates for both vaccines are dependent on actions of the um, FDA. Yeah, and I, if I could, this is Sarah, if I could just add, part of that decision is going to have to include ultra cold storage, top numbers of doses, enrolled providers. Um, you know, there's quite a few variables of who's getting vaccinated, um, how many doses of each vaccine we actually have and, and where it may go um, to, to kind of balance what we end up selecting. And, and that'll definitely be a very collaborative uh, team decision. Monica, I have a hand up from Amy Gamet. Great, thank you. And I just wanted to make sure, did we uh, did we adequately answer that last question or do we need to review anything else or did, that, did we get it covered? No, yeah, this is Dr. Sandy. I think that, um, I think that covered, I, you know, my point is that if we're only supposed to use a single vaccine for the pharmacy LTCF program, then combining the availability of both vaccines gives an inaccurate inventory, right? Because our Pfizer may ramp up faster, but uh, the Moderna is gonna lag behind that. And uh, we may have quote unquote 50% capacity, but most of that may be Pfizer and not Moderna. And then we run into all those ultra cold um, issues and 
And um, so that was just my point that if we're going to say we've got to look at each vaccine separately from a volume standpoint. Thank you for that clarification. Any other comments to address that? Yeah, um, this is Chris Hunt, and I'm sorry I didn't didn't quite. Could could we go to that slide that shows the Moderna and the Pfizer? Thank you. Um, I think what you're pointing out is that in week two, when we're saying, "Oh, we'll have enough," um, those two vaccines are very different. Um, and but regardless, um, even if we said uh, the pharmacy program is going to get all Moderna, for example, there's enough in that group to get them all Moderna vaccine, or if we decide to give them all Pfizer, either way, there's enough to start that program. But you're right, the handling, and there are a lot of considerations. Um, I think our thinking initially was that we would probably, for the long-term care um, partnership, uh, potentially uh, have them use Moderna vaccine because of the greater ease in handling, because now you're leaving sites that have uh, the ultra-cold freezers, et cetera. Uh, but I was surprised to see, I showed you in that slide earlier from the MMWR, um, there was a sort of a consideration for, um, or almost a recommendation for considering giving Pfizer vaccine to the pharmacy partnership. So I think there are pluses and minuses either way, but I think, and I'm sorry, is that Dr. Sandy that was speaking? I'm sorry, I wasn't quite sure. Um, I, th I think you're... Yeah. I think you were asking about the su the sufficient supply, and I hope this I hope these numbers reassure you that either way, um, we have to we have to pick one vaccine or the other. But as far as numbers, we meet that criteria in week two. Thank you, Dr. Han. So, I think we're ready to look at our next uh, hands up that we have, uh, Amy Gamet. Uh, yeah, it may. This may be a mute point uh, after looking at Kathy Turner's chat and clarification for the health districts um, when they start vaccinating the non-participating uh, long-term care facilities. Will some of that vaccine then um, be allocated to us um, from the pharmacy partner vaccine, separate from our other allocation? Sarah, would you like to take that? I'm sorry, I was looking at the chat to to make sure some questions were answered. Um, can you repeat the question, Amy, please? Yeah, and it looks like there's enough vaccine um, in the first three weeks for everybody in those first two categories of our 1A anyway. But um, just for the health department clarification, when we're getting vaccine for the non-participating long-term care facilities, are we getting that through the pharmacy program then, some of that vaccine allocated? Um, or it's coming the way the rest of our vaccine is being allocated. I, I guess the question, I just wonder if we're getting right away all the two different doses and from two different um, entities. Yeah, so th thanks for repeating that. Um, for the pharmacies that are, for the facilities that did not choose the pharmacy partnership program, we and we're working with and also with you all uh the public health districts to identify those facilities and i and have them choose of who will vaccinate them so it may be a local pharmacy it may be the local public health department but that allocation comes from the state's allocation did that answer your question yes thank you you're welcome Thank you. Let's move to our next uh, hand up. I see Nate Thompson. Hi all, uh, Nate Thompson. I'm uh, uh, representing Idaho Academy of Physician Assistants this is my role on this committee, but uh, uh, clinically I practice as a hospitalist for St. Luke's, primarily Boise and uh, also Meridian Nampa. Um, I take care of COVID patients. I work on uh, what we've kind of designated as COVID wards. And I want to speak kind of from that clinical perspective to emphasize a point that Dr. Bridges made, which is that residents of long-term care facilities are disproportionately uh, likely to die of this condition. They are disproportionately likely to be hospitalized with this condition. They are disproportionately likely to have a long course of hospitalization, taking up many uh, hospital uh, days. And uh, at the kind of current state, when they are positive, uh, for COVID-19 and kind of having a prolonged course of shedding, which can be 
uh, up to 20 days in folks who have a severe course of illness, uh, they can at times be difficult uh, to uh, disposition effectively from the hospital, uh, which further impacts on capacity. Um, so all that is to say that uh, early immunization of long-term care facility residents not only protects them, uh, a population of people who are very, uh, again, at risk of death or severe course of illness, in many ways it helps protect uh, us who work in hospitals and it helps uh, maintain uh, hospital capacity uh, by reducing the likelihood of, uh, of folks having to come into the hospital, have a prolonged stay in the hospital, and then in some cases uh, have difficulty um, uh, moving out of the hospital. Um, I think the long-term care facilities have been really excellent partners in taking uh, patients who have COVID-19, but not all are able to take patients. And to uh, Randall Hudspeth's question, um, some are, some aren't, uh, but having broad immunization of residents uh, in as early a phase uh, of our immunization of plan as possible, I think would allow many more uh, facilities to uh, take patients knowing that their existing residents have a measure of protection. Um, so all that is to say, I strongly favor this, not only from the perspective of protecting those residents, but with eye to the fact that it actually helps uh, protect hospitals, hospital workers, and preserve hospital capacity. So uh, thanks so much. Comments or response? Monica, we do have some more questions in the chat, if we're ready. We also right. have more hands raised. Too, Monica. Yes. Excellent. No, I just wanted to see if anyone wanted to respond to, to Nate's comment before we move on. Um, but thank you for sharing that. It was pretty um, probably self-explanatory in itself. So thank you. Uh, let's move then to uh, Daryl Tom Daryl Anderson, please. Hands up. Uh, thank you. This is just a quick question for uh, just looking at the, the number of doses in those first three weeks. And somebody said earlier, it appears that, I mean, it's almost about 90,000 which does, if you take that cumulative chart that you showed earlier, does take us through those first three levels. But my question is on that cumulative chart on the number of folks that are in each of those categories, what's the um, assumption on how many people will actually take the vaccine in those groups? Because I've talked to a couple of healthcare leaders who have suggested that maybe 50% of folks will take it. So is that factored into those numbers, which would then suggest I, we would have adequate number of doses for sure to deal with the cases, I mean, the, the, the number of folks that are in each of those buckets fairly easily. I just don't know if there's an adoption rate assumed in those cumulative numbers or they just assume 100% adoption because I, my sense is that's not going to be the case. And some of you are much closer to it than I am, but a couple of leaders I've talked to have polled their people and they said maybe 50. So just, qu just a question mark. It seems like those first three week numbers seem to meet the needs of those, those at least the first three chairs. Yeah, there are, uh, there are others that can respond as well, but we we are aware. That, thank you for that. And um, we also are just getting that information back from hospitals and expecting that maybe only 50% of people will be interested. I think one of the challenges, and this has been observed in other immunization campaigns, is that uh, interest tends to start going up. You know, once people see their colleagues getting vaccinated and they're seem to be okay and they're you know that th that number can be very variable and we uh don't want to by any means undercount um so i think even though those numbers that you were shown are total population estimates we we're we, we that's one reason why sarah mentioned in the beginning that flexibility and and nimbleness that we have to be able to plan on so that if there's high uptake we have enough vaccine however if there's lower uptake then uh you know, then we have a plan on what to do with those remaining doses so they're not wasted, which would be the worst outcome possible. And I don't know, Dr. Bridges or Sarah, if you want to add to that or Elke. Yeah, this is Carolyn. Just to reiterate that I think that's where that list and having that rank order is super helpful. So if you're in a facility and, and you have exhausted the number of people who are interested in that category, for um, getting that vaccine, then you can, you know, work your way down that list. So public health departments can do so um, as well. Thank you, Dr. Bridges. Uh, Dr. Bridges, I noticed that your hand was up earlier as well. Did you have another comment or something to share since we have you right now? 
Yeah, thanks. I just wanted to note there was a question in the chat from Jeff Keller uh, about inmates living in assisted living um, types of settings. And that did come up, uh, was mentioned also in the ACIP uh, discussion that um, Chris Hahn mentioned. So, um, uh, you know, I, I just wanted to make sure people knew that that question was out there. Long term care facilities, um, uh, regardless of location, is a long term care facility. So, it seems like that is a discussion that would need to be um, happen with the health department to, to figure out how, how to make sure that there's equity there. Yeah, so um, Monica, since Carolyn um, indicated that there's some questions in the chat, can we move to that? It's getting pretty full. Absolutely, yes, that was my next my next turn. Since we had Dr. Bridges, I just wanted to ask her to finish up there. So yes, absolutely. Okay, yeah. thanks. So um, the question is, um, is there a recommendation for those who have tested positive for for SARS-CoV-2, so they've been infected or have had COVID-like illness, um, what is the recommendation for vaccinating those those folks in these populations? I'd like to take that. I could, this is Chris Hahn, I can, I can take that. Um, the MMWR that um, Angela is gonna send you all links to does address that. Um, and uh, that, that was that clinical guidance uh, webpage that I pulled up earlier. Um, there is a comment in there about people who have had, conf and, and Taffy, please correct me if I didn't get the question quite right, but it, I think it was about people who've had it, yeah. um, that people who have had the disease uh, within the last 90 days may consider delaying, uh, may not be the first ones in line kind of thing. It's kind of soft language, uh, but that's one reason I wanted you all to have that link so as you start planning your vaccination campaigns and or as others start playing their campaigns, they're aware that that language is there. I think that's going to be a, a tough one to implement on a practical level, uh, but that language is there if, if um, you know, um, individuals feel strongly they would rather defer or if uh, vaccinators want to encourage that. Anybody else have any comments on that? No. Okay. Yeah, uh, thanks, Chris. That was perfect. That was a perfect answer to that question. Um, I also want to point folks to the chat. Um, it's getting full, but um, we've included a link to some um, some data that Mel Libertson was referencing, which is about um, the case burden um, and outcomes in long-term care facility residents and staff. Um, we will send that around after the meeting um, along with the other publication links. Um, and then there is a question about any indication on how long immunity from the vaccine will last. This is Carolyn, I, I can uh, take a shot at that. Of course, we won't really know that until after people are vaccinated and uh, we're able to follow their courses of illness. So no, no way to know that really in advance. Thank you. Next question from the chat. Um, the next question is whether or not CVAC will be need, will need to advise the department on which vaccine should be used in the in the pharmacy partnership program. Who can answer that one? This is Chris Hahn. That, that's a great question, and so I'd defer that to Sarah Leeds because. Um, until I saw the MMWR, I think we felt pretty confident that we just thought the Moderna made sense, um, was the sense of our, our discussions internally. Um, but uh, Sarah, could you maybe let us know your thoughts on whether you would appreciate input on that or you have, with your program staff from a planning perspective, have already uh, feel fairly, fairly comfortable one way or the other, I guess. Sure, and I just want to confirm I heard the question right. It was are we seeking input to choose which vaccine would go to the partnership? Correct. Okay. Um, I think that we need to definitely have the program do those assessments and really look at, at the number of doses, the providers, their capacity. Um, they're, they're, they've all filled out uh, capacity assessments and what their vaccine throughput is also look at once they start vaccinating what their cadence of vaccine is and i think that will play into uh 
the way we recommend um, recommend that. So, so I think really the program needs to make that decision with with some guidance from our leadership. Great questions, okay. everyone. More questions yeah. in the chat. We are um, time wise. Um, it would be good for us to be able to move into our vote as soon as we can, but I, I'm not sure how much more we have on the chat right now. Monica, I think uh, we've. Dr. Burgess, can you put the vote slide back up? I'm sorry, uh, Catherine, were you still, Kathy, were you still speaking? <laughs> um, thanks, Dr. Burgess. No, we, we're through with the chat. Excellent. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Well, it's been a great discussion. We actually were a little ahead of schedule, but now we're getting to where we do need to uh, get our vote done because we have one more presentation. So um, um, we'll get back to, I see some more things popping up in the chat, and I think we'll get back to that here shortly. But um, I think we were going to use our little megaphone button uh, to vote yes or no. So again, this is our uh, our vote, which is basically when uh, do we support a plan that when we have the 50% necessary to activate the part partnership program, um, you know, knowing that those supply numbers that we gave you week one, two, and three might change. So that 50% might come earlier or later than week one, two, or three. But whenever we get to that, um, feeling comfortable activating that partnership uh, to get the long-term care facility staff and residents vaccinated. So before we vote, I want to make sure I covered the wording properly. Does anybody want to, to clarify what we're voting on? Um, and then we'll do the yes, no vote for voting members only. We do have folks on here that are ex officio and we want to have the vote be by the voting members. You covered, Patrice, this is Elke, you covered the vote perfectly. Okay, thank you. Um, so if uh, that uh, makes it clear, please go to your little megaphone that we showed you earlier and give us a yes, no, if you are one of the voting members. And then Monica, I think I might have you be the one to announce the results here in a minute, sure. if that's okay. Absolutely. I'm Pulling it up right now to make sure I can see it. And then don't don't leave because we have one more great presentation to learn more about the uh, the studies here at the end. And then we have some wrap up comments as well. So well, we have 29 voting members who have voted so far, and that's pretty close to what we've seen before. We have 29 or we're up to 30. Give it a few more seconds, maybe, and I think we'll be ready to um, to announce. This is when we yeah. need that, um, you know, Jeopardy music. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> I will just count down. Let's give it five more seconds. I think we're there. I just want to make sure everyone has the opportunity. All right, let's go ahead and close the vote. We have 31 yeses, zero noes. So there we have it. Excellent. Thank you guys so much. That's an important thing for us to get accomplished today. Um, so we'll get to the chat here in a minute, but let's go to uh, Dr. Bridges for the next presentation. Um, thank you, Rodani. Um, I'm going to just provide a, one of the participants asked for some information about phase one. Uh, studies for the two vaccines that are um, going to be ready first. So uh, I put together some uh, slides that I'm happy um, to share uh, with, again, the caveat that this is all preliminary data. It's going to uh, change and we really have to wait for those emergencies authorizations and then publication of the phase uh, three trial data. Um, so this information comes from presentations where there was publicly available information and some peer reviewed publications that are ready. And some of this is a bit technical, so I apologize for that in advance. Next slide. Um, again, both of these vaccines that are going to be available first, we hope, are mRNA vaccines. Uh, the preliminary information is that both vaccines are like to be highly, likely to be very effective, highly effective, uh, and we 
talked multiple times about the cold chain challenges with the Pfizer vaccine in particular. Additional COVID-19 vaccines um, are in development that use different platforms. They're non-mRNA uh, vaccines, and we expect to see uh, more of those uh, with results that they're able to um, announce. So I'm going to talk about some of the data available from those uh, phase one studies, as well as some storage and handling uh, issues. And to note that once the emergency use authorizations are issued, then CDC will have a suite of training materials that they will be able to share. They mentioned on their public calls that they expect those materials to be available on their website within 24 hours of when the emergency use authorization uh, is approved. And you can find a link um, on the slides to where that information should be housed. Next slide. So um, the other thing that you can do is go to the CDC website. Uh, the, the link is provided. And if you go down to the far right hand page of those uh, uh, web pages, you can um, request to get email updates. And when different pages are updated, it will send you an email so that you'll know to go and um, look for that update. Next slide. Um, they also have more information that is um, coming, but some that is available now about how to explain uh, mRNA vaccines to patients. And again, um, we expect a lot more information and tools, um, posters, you know, all kinds of things that they develop to become available on that website. Next slide. So at the um, August, 26, 2020 meeting. Uh, Chris Hahn alluded to this um, in her earlier presentation, but this was one of the earlier meetings on COVID vaccines. At this particular meeting, both Moderna and the Pfizer BioNTech companies presented some of their phase one slash two uh, studies. The presentations uh, from both of these companies, companies are available on the CDC website. So again, you can, uh, anyone can go out there and um, download the exact presentations shared to the um, ACIP. Next slide. So uh, the summary uh, for the Moderna vaccine um, based on that meeting was based on a, a studies of a small number, around 130 people. So these are the people who were studied before they launched their uh, larger um, trials. Uh, in terms of the immuno immunogenicity or how uh, the immune response was after vaccine, uh, the working group concluded that um, there were neutralizing antibodies, so there was a good immune response. It elicited a response uh, in CD4 cells, which is a type of white blood cell. Um, and they found that the antibody levels or the immune response was similar or better than the immune response that people receive after a natural infection. In terms of safety, what they concluded was that um, there were local and uh, systemic, like body aches, uh, fever symptoms, um, and the most common symptoms that were reported were pain, myalgia, and fatigue. And they found that those types of um, side effects were higher after the second dose. Uh, they found no serious adverse reactions from the vaccines. Next slide. So uh, now I'm going to provide you with um, some links and information about the specific studies. And you can, uh, of course, uh, download these. These are also publicly available. Um, and it provides information on the various groups. The first studies that they do look at the immune response and they try and determine what dose of the vaccine is the best, what dose kind of optimizes the immune response and also um, safety. For the Moderna vaccine, they broke their studies into two. The first uh, one I'll show you here looked at adults 18 to 45 years of age. And again, this is a small, these are initial, you know, safety immune response studies. Next slide. 
and you cannot even see this. Um, that's why I have the links there for you. You can go into yourself, but I think if you just look at the blue and the orange, you can see there's more blue and orange after the second dose than with um, the first dose. Next slide. Um, and then looking at the um, antibody response, clear over on the right. I'm going to try and use my cursor. You can see that, but clear on the right, uh, on the top right um, quadrant, that is the antibody levels for people who had a natural infection. That's what we call convalescent antibody levels. And if you look at um, uh, the two kind of middle uh, group, um, you can see that the after the second dose, they actually saw a, a fair increase in antibody after the first dose, but really after the second dose was where you saw a substantial increase in antibody levels, and that antibody level um, met or exceeded um, the antibody level for natural infection. So that's that's a very good thing. Next slide. The next study that they uh, published was for um, adults. Uh, older adults, these are 56 to 70 years of age, and they compared those adults to uh, adults 71 years of age and older, and they looked at two doses, their 25 microgram dose and their 100 microgram dose. Next slide. And again, if you just look at the colors here, when they're looking at um, uh, side effects after the vaccine, you see that um, it's more after the second dose compared to the first. So that's something, of course, we'll want um, everyone to be aware of um, and um, uh, to expect that that may happen. And as you can see, most of the more severe reactions, these are grade three reactions. So um, things like fatigue and, um, and body aches that um, orange means that those symptoms interfered with someone's ability to do their daily work. So, or the normal things that they do in a day. And so those are the orange, you can see relatively few people were had that orange category, that more severe category. The other thing that the authors noted is that the um, proportion of people who had a more severe reaction was lower uh, among older adults compared to younger adults. Next slide. And this is just uh, immune uh, reaction or antibody level data, uh, immune protection data for um, these older adult populations. And again, you still see that they're, um, while their antibody titers or their immune protection um, estimates were a bit lower than younger adults, they still had quite substantial uh, antibody levels that met or exceeded the um, convalescent, so that antibody level for people who that had natural infection. So again, um, very good um, sign there. Next slide. So moving on to the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, um, the working group review, reviewed their initial um, data. And again, they also concluded that the vaccine produced a good immune response, um, both for um, different types of white blood cells uh, and they, um, based on these studies, they selected a 30 microgram uh, dose, and they had looked at two different um, uh, candidate vaccines, and the candidate vaccine they selected was this BNT162B2. And I say the only because it, it matters in the next slide. So these initial studies helped them to select which particular formulation uh, they wanted to go forward with in their phase three trials and which dose. In terms of the safety data, the most common side effects that they found for the Pfizer vaccine were similar, fatigue, headache, and muscle pain, those are the most common. And um, again, they found that, um, that uh, reactogenicity or those side effects uh, were less in older populations compared to younger populations that they studied. Next slide. Okay, so this is even busier slide, but essentially this looks at those um, different doses, shows the number of participants. And unlike the Moderna publications, the Pfizer publications puts all of those age groups into a single um, study. So they describe their, their population in these initial 
uh, studies. Next slide. And then they looked at their um, immunogenicity and um, reactogenicity. So this is side effects or reactogenicity. And again, the vaccine that they selected, if you look at the column on the right, that's what they selected is um, the B2. Pain at the injection site was most often reported um, uh, for dose one and for dose two. Next, next slide, please. And again, looking at the right-hand column, um, they look at dose one and dose two. So now the, that VNT, the B2, is in the second and the fourth rows. And um, you see a little bit more of the gray. Gray is that uh, in this uh, slide is the more severe uh, reactions. And you see um, more people, uh, although a, a not a huge proportion, but a few more people in uh, after the second dose experiencing that symptom compared to the first dose. And it uh, looks like uh, that was more often reported for the symptom of Next slide. And this is their um, immunogenicity or their antibody level or protective uh, antibody level. On the far right, you can see the black um, uh, bar uh, or column, and that is the convalescent serum. So that's the antibody level of people who've had natural infection. And uh, you can see that after that um, second dose and a bit even before, uh, after the first dose, that you see uh, a, a high amount of antibody and that um, protective level uh, meets or exceeds the amount that they measured in people who had had natural infection. The next slide. So uh, their phase three studies have not been published, although they have both manufacturers have put information on their website and you can go and um, look at that. Um, there are some uh, important uh, differences in these two vaccines that have been studied um, that need to be considered for vaccine um, handling and administration. The Moderna vaccine uh, is two doses, but the interval is um, zero days and then 28 days for the first or the second dose, excuse me, whereas the Pfizer has a 21 day interval. So for Pfizer, the second dose can be given uh, 21 or days or more after um, the, the first dose. Um, age groups are um, similar in large part. There were some children studied uh, ages uh, 12 to 15 in the Pfizer study, but that's uh, very small. And we expect that there'll be more studies done down the road uh, that are focused on um, learning more about these vaccines in children. The emergency use authorizations have been submitted, as we all know, and those VRPAC meetings of FDA are um, scheduled. Both vaccines are around 94, 95% effective, which is amazing. And um, it appears that they also, uh, among those breakthrough cases uh, of people who got sick, that um, it also prevented um, severe disease. So among people who still got COVID, even after being vaccinated, you had a significantly reduced risk of severity. So what I have had in this a number of cases, these are number of people who tested positive for COVID in the study, not the number of people included in the studies overall. The number of people included in these studies is over 30,000 people. Uh, I'm sorry, 30,000 for the Moderna vaccine and over about 44,000 people, I believe, in the Pfizer. vaccine. In terms of safety, again, they uh, found results that are not um, different from what they found in the phase one in large part. Um, and uh, we've already talked about vaccine production estimates, but just a reminder, we're, uh, the U.S. is competing globally for, for these vaccines. Next slide. And then uh, the shipping and storage, Moderna ships at minus 20, Pfizer at the minus 70, minus 75 on dry ice. The number of days Moderna can be at refrigerator temperature is 30. It's only five days for Pfizer vaccine. The number of hours at room temperature also is different. Neither of these vaccines can be refrozen if um, 
if they're thawed or put in the refrigerator, you cannot refreeze them. The shipping uh, doses uh, minimum uh, we've already discussed. And um, the Moderna vaccine it has um, 10 doses per vial and BioNTech has five. Um, once uh, the vaccine is reconstituted, the Pfizer vaccine, uh, you have to use that within six hours of reconstitution. That vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine will come with a vial of normal saline to be used. Uh, and that is what you will reconstitute it or mix it with. Uh, they're both given intramuscularly and um, it also comes with a range of needle sizes. Remember for adults, the needle size is one or one and a half um, inches. Neither of these vaccines has preservatives. That's another important thing to remember. Um, and that's part of the reason why you see this use time is uh, very limited. Next slide. Dr. Bridges, if I could just ask you real quick, we had a question from Dr. Burgess about the uh, number of participants in the trials compared to most trials. Could you comment on that really quick? Yeah, these trials for, uh, for uh, compared to other vaccine trials, these are very large studies. So these are uh, larger, as large, if not larger than typical on um, the vaccine studies that we have. Excellent, thank you. And we have about a few minutes left, left in our meeting today. I know you have a few slides to get to as well. Um, but just to help you got us through that. Got yeah. it, Monica. <laughs> uh, just to let you know that there is a vaccine storage and handling um, manual that's on the CDC website. It now has some new information uh, specific to COVID-19 vaccines, but will also need to be um, updated as those EUAs are finalized. And as a provider who agrees to be a COVID-19 vaccine provider, uh, you are re required to follow the storage and handling requirements for COVID-19 vaccine that are included in this handling uh, storage and handling kit. Next slide. Um, this storage kit, I'm just going to show you a couple things, has a lot of information in there about specifics about storage and handling. Uh, importantly, for people who do a lot of immunizing, you need to have um, temperature monitoring, this cold storage and Ensuring the cold chain is absolutely critical and there will need to be specific um, digital data loggers for ultra cold uh, temperatures as the typical ones that are used by immunization programs uh, may not uh, work at the minus 70 degrees that we need for the Pfizer vaccine storage. Next slide. Recording temperatures, very important. All this is in the uh, provider uh, agreement and in that storage and handling guide as well. Um, those records uh, to ensure proper storage and um, recording those temperatures, uh, providers are required to keep those records for a minimum of three years. Next slide. Um, there's also information in here about some of the specifics. Uh, I've gone over some of this regarding the storage and handling. This vaccine B, this is actually uh, the Moderna uh, vaccine. Um, it's going to be shipped through a, a distributor called McKesson to the administration site. And again, it can be at refrigerator temperature for 30 uh, days. Of course, uh, we don't want to see anybody um, keeping this stuff in their refrigerator for, uh, for weeks and months. We hope it gets um, utilized as soon as it can. Next slide. And then for um, the Pfizer vaccine, of course, there's uh, this is significantly more challenging and if we had more time, we could go into the um, specifics of storage and handling, but um, we'll, we'll make these slides available. Next slide. Shipping containers here. Again, the important part is um, these uh, shipping containers that come with the vaccine need to be reloaded with dry ice. That dry ice will, uh, for the first reload of these shippers, will be sent um, with the containers. Uh, or within 24 hours. So within 24 hours of the arrival, the Pfizer vaccine providers will need to add um, dry ice uh, to that a container uh, if the vaccine is not going directly into ultra cold storage. Next slide. And this is just another picture of that box. Next slide. These are the ancillary supplies that are going to come with the COVID-19 vaccines. 
Uh, they'll include needles, syringes, alcohol pads. They'll have surgical masks and face shields for vaccinators, but if you're having a lot of people um, help, uh, then um, uh, you will need extra. So this is not enough for a lot of volunteers or other people. Uh, so don't count on this as being your only supply. You'll also be given um, record cards uh, for patients to have a written record of which vaccine that they received, and that'll help them uh, remind them and have a written record for the providers about exactly which vaccine they received and when they received it so they can get the right dose and the right vaccine at the right time for their second dose. Next slide. There's more information again on the site about best practices for vaccine administration. Next slide. And um, the last thing I wanted to mention is vSAFE. So um, there are many existing vaccine safety monitoring systems that have been in place for many years. All vaccines are monitored for safety, uh, of course, before they're licensed and then also after they're licensed. This is a routine occurrence um, of vaccine safety monitoring that happens uh, every day. So there are a lot of existing systems there that work. There's a new system that CDC has been working with others to develop called VSAFE. And um, this is a, a gonna be a very important um, additional system that all of our providers we hope will help um, encourage their patients to participate. Um, this is a, a phone or mobile phone based system that um, patients when they get their first dose will be um, encouraged to voluntarily sign up for and then we'll send you text messages and um, ask about any symptoms you have after getting vaccinated and there will be follow up if there are any um, uh, serious adverse events that people are um, I uh, want to talk to the patient more. So it's a voluntary program that would be um, a very um, helpful to encourage people. Next slide. And just the web links to um, where you can find more information as it becomes available. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bridges. That was a tremendous amount of information to share with the group. And I think these slides will be excellent for reference for everyone to go back to and dig into some of those details. Um, after the meeting. So great reference document as well. Thank you so much. That was a lot to ask in the 20 minutes. So thank you. Uh, with that, I think we're ready to, uh, we're going to have to turn to wrap up. I realize some of you might have questions on all the information you just heard. And um, we will make the material available after the meeting, of course, for you to review in more detail. Now, I'd imagine we could gather some of those questions through our um, our respective email boxes and answer those questions, I would imagine, if there seems to be a need there as well. So, um, Monica, we do have a hand raised from Brad Ritchie. Okay, um, sure, we uh, probably take it really quick and then we'll move, move into wrap up. Uh, hi there, good afternoon. And it's gonna be a real quick comment. Uh, I just wanna let everybody know that the uh, when we start talking about the cold chain process, there's hackers out there right now looking at what's available and how to do it. They're aware of the equipment, they're aware of the supply chain, and they're starting to starting a global uh, phishing campaign. So again, anybody that's storing or handling the vaccine, just be aware if you do have an issue, if you see an issue, you hear about an issue, please don't hesitate to contact the FBI or uh, give me a call and I'll get you in touch with them. Excellent, thank you so much. That's important information. All right, everyone, let's go ahead and uh, move into our wrap up. We covered a lot today. Uh, we uh, got some great updates on vaccine planning, the, the uh, sub-prioritizations from last time for our essentials worker group, uh, what ACIP has been working on, and then a discussion on when to activate the pharmacy, uh, the LTCF uh, partnership, and we voted on that together. Thank you everyone for that. We had a unanimous vote, and then we received some great information just now from Dr. Bridges um, on the details of the different uh, vaccines, the studies, the results, other considerations, and again, great reference material for you to go back to. Uh, which we, of course, will send out after the meeting, along with those other links that we talked about as well that may have gone in the chat, but I think we'll just all send them out together for you. Um, in terms of, uh, let me see, let's, uh, 
action items. We don't, I don't believe we have any specific action items this time. Uh, but of course, as I mentioned before, if anybody, whether it be CVAC members or the public has any questions or comments, please continue to send them in through the respective email addresses. Uh, we showed the one for the public in the beginning, and I don't know if I can put my hands on that really quickly. I just thought I would mention it one more time. Uh, actually, if someone could type that in the chat while I'm speaking, that'd be great. It'll send, save us some time, and then I'll read it in a minute. Um, I just don't have it right in front of me here. So our next meeting is scheduled for two weeks from now, December 18th, same time. Uh, of course, we've been mentioning this throughout our work together because things are changing so rapidly. There may be a time when we have to change the schedule, meet more, more often, and then uh, December 18th, we'll let you know what things look like for the new year. But likely um, at de uh, December 18th, unless anything big changes, we may, may be taking a break till January. So that is the plan, knowing what we know today. Uh, before I hand it over to uh, Dr. Burgess and Elke for closing remarks, I just uh, want to also mention that there are a lot of staff working behind the scenes who we didn't acknowledge or, or introduce in the beginning of the meeting. Um, those, those names can be found in the meeting summary reports that are being posted online as they become available. But just want to let you all know it takes, uh, it takes a village uh, to prepare for these meetings. There are a lot of moving parts and I wanted to acknowledge everyone and your help in making the meeting successful. With that, uh, let's turn to closing remarks. Oh, and here is, sorry, before I do, here is that uh, email. I'm sure you saw it while I was talking, but this is our public input email. And then we have another one that has been communicated to our CVAC members as well. All right, thanks everyone. Now back to uh, Dr. Burgess and Elke. Yes, Catrice, uh, we're out of time. So I'm just gonna thank everybody again. Um, uh, Brad Ritchie brought up an excellent point. Uh, the risk of transparency is also that people can use those, uh, that information uh, to, to bad uh, purposes. So be aware of that. And, but also we are committed to transparency. The coronavirusidaho.gov website is, a, is the place where you're gonna see uh, all of this information. There's a vaccine tab. And also, uh, as promised, we are working on talking points to get out to all of the committee members, which we will be getting out uh, to you between meetings. And uh, again, thanks for a great meeting today, great participation and great information. And uh, I'll turn it over to Elke. Great, thank you, Dr. Burgess. Um, I also echo the thank yous for your participation. We know that there are a lot of questions that continue to come in all the time. Um, in the spirit of word that you heard repeatedly, uh, the word fluidity, um, just keep in mind that things are ever changing as we learn more information. So as was mentioned a couple of times, you know, we may have to pull you back in um, kind of emergency type arrangement to make a quick decision. We may have to ask you to, to participate uh, via an email poll or something to that nature. But we do want to make sure that we um, are also respectful of the, com the copious amounts of comments and questions that are coming in on the subprioritization of populations for vaccines. And so make sure that you take the time to look at those comments as we send them out to you. And we are having some conversations right now about how to how to better have a kind of an interactive conversation about those with you all. So stay tuned and uh, we look forward to seeing you on December 18th.